Hello, here I am with Jess the dog again. <laughs> and I'm going to read chapters 28 to 32 of The Ice Monster by David Williams. Chapter 28, A Giant Catapult. What seemed like a split second later, she was lying in a crumpled heap on the floor of Sir Ray Lancaster's oak-panelled office. The girl had brought a cloud of soot with her and she couldn't help coughing and spluttering as she tried to breathe. <coughs> as the cloud passed, she found herself face to face with a horned creature. No! As her hand reached out to stop it attacking her, she realised it was stuffed. A plinth underneath read, Pyrenean Ibex. Well, not that Elsie could read. The girl scrambled to her feet. Although everything hurt, she hadn't broken any bones. Elsie took the copper wire in her hand and tiptoed over to the door of the office. She rattled the handle. It was locked. Blast! That wasn't part of the plan. There must be a key somewhere in the room. Elsie opened every drawer, turned every box upside down and swept her hands over every shelf. But she couldn't find it anywhere. There was a cupboard of clothes and she felt in every pocket, but there was no key. Elsie looked back at the strange horned creature. It looked back at her. The stuffed Pyrenean ibex was the perfect battering ram. She leapt onto the creature's back and, using her feet to power it along, slammed against the heavy oak door. It barely made a scratch. Bing! Elsie had an idea. She returned to the cupboard and pulled out a pair of elasticated braces from some trousers that were hanging there. She tied the ends of the braces to the leg of the heavy desk on one side and to the door handle on the other. Then she moved the ibex into position with the braces behind its behind. Using all her might, the might pulled it as far back as she possibly could. Elsie had created a giant catapult. When she couldn't hold it for a moment longer, she let it go. The braces shot the ibex across the office. It smashed through the door. Boom! It sent shards of wood flying through the air. Whiz! Elsie couldn't help but smile at the destruction she had caused. She picked up the end of the copper wire and with a smile on her face waltzed through the hole she had made in the door. Chapter 29, Dino Ladder Down in the main hall, the professor was sitting in his wheelchair, staring up at the ice monster. Frozen air was smouldering from the glass tank. Elsie dashed down the steps to join him. The ice! It's melting! she exclaimed. Yes, child, I turned off the cooling system, replied the professor. Otherwise, we would never get the end of that copper wire into the creature's heart. But what if we bring it back to life and it immediately drowns in the water? I've thought of that, young lady. That's what this is for. From under his wheelchair, he produced a frightening tool that looked halfway between a hammer and an axe. A pickaxe. Yes, child. This will break through the glass. Now, are you ready? <clears throat> ready for what? To dive into the tank, of course. Me? Yes, you. I can't swim. What if I drown? The professor thought for a moment. Then, urchin, you will be immortalised. Immortalised? Yes, immortalised as a short footnote. A footnote is a short note written at the bottom of a page, like this. In the story of how I, the great professor, 
brought the ice monster back to life. Now, climb to the top of the tank. Elsie looked around the hall. Have you got a ladder, Professor? she asked. The man's expression darkened. Oops, he replied. I forgot that. Not so great after all, are you? mused the girl. The professor gripped the pickaxe tightly. I'll, I'll find a way, said Elsie. She looked around the main hall for something, anything that could be used as a ladder. Elsie realised that the answer was standing right next to her. The Diplodocus, she exclaimed. The enormous dinosaur skeleton was towering over her. You can climb that, he asked. Yes, I have monkey feet. I'll think of it as a dino ladder. What a genius idea of mine, announced the professor. Then, when you reach the tank, you must swim down to the creature's hut. I already told you, I can't swim, but I could sink. What do you mean? Professor, may I borrow that pickaxe? Be my guest. The girl took it from him. It felt really heavy, but she did her best to pretend it wasn't. She marched over to a glass cabinet that housed a rock the size of a football. Crash! She smashed the glass and heaved out the rock. That's a meteorite, remarked the professor. Here you go, she said, passing back the pickaxe. This meteorite will make me sink. Oh, what a splendid idea of mine, he mused. Elsie placed the end of the copper wire back in her mouth and picked up the rock. Slowly but surely, her monkey feet began stepping along the bones of the tail. As if climbing a dinosaur skeleton, holding a meteorite, wasn't hard enough already, it was dark in the museum. The only light was the occasional flash of lightning outside the snow-encrusted windows. Quickly, ordered the professor. We're going to lose the lightning. I'm going as fast as I can, snapped back the girl. The bones themselves were smooth, which meant it was very easy to slip on them. Elsie took it slowly, letting her toes grip as tightly as they could. In a short while, she had reached the skeleton's back. This being a much wider part, she managed to speed up. Now the girl was at the base of the neck, a very long way up. Elsie looked down. That was a mistake. It was a very long way down. Instantly she felt dizzy. She shut her eyes. Oh, this must just made her feel wobblier. Why on earth have you stopped, you pathetic, pathetic child? Elsie took a deep breath. <sighs> a bolt of lightning struck just outside the window illuminating everything for a split second. The girl knew she had to act now. Still holding the meteorite, she took a step forward, and another, and another. Soon she was halfway across the skeleton's neck and within leaping distance of the mammoth's, the mammoth's tank. Boom! A roll of thunder ro roared across the sky. It was so loud that the museum shook a little. It made... It made Elsie's heart skip a beat, and she lost her footing. Ah! she screamed. Chapter 30. The Heart of the Storm Elsie tumbled forward, but, by beautiful chance, the back of her coat hooked onto one of the Diplodocus bones. Without even realising quite what had happened, the girl found herself swinging in the air, still miraculously holding on to the meteorite. I'm alive! she exclaimed. Yes, I can see that, you foolish child. Now come on, stop dilly-dallying. We haven't got all night. The girl swung her legs forward and gripped onto the neck bones. With her legs wrapped tightly around the exhibit, she unhooked her coat and swung herself back up, 
using the meteorite for momentum. The skull of the Diplodocus, Diplodocus was within spitting distance of the tank. From there, she leaped onto the top. Doink! The tank was freezing and her toes tingled with the cold. Have you found the hatch? demanded the professor. Elsie looked ahead. Yes! Unscrew the bolts around the edge. She put down the meteorite and opened the hatch. Now, get in and push the end of the copper wire into the mammoth's heart, just where I showed you. Elsie nodded, picked up the meteorite and plunged down into the icy water. Splosh! Ah! she exclaimed. The cold shocked her and she could hardly breathe. Still holding the meteorite, she sank like a stone. Within a second, she was at the bottom of the tank. From his wheelchair, the professor frantically pointed out to Elsie where the creature's heart was. Elsie let go of the meteorite and floated upwards, plunging the end of the copper wire deep into the mammoth's chest. Elsie now felt completely out of breath and let herself float back up to the top of the tank. Her head bobbing through the hatch, she gasped for air. <gasps> With her entire body shaking from the cold, she hauled herself up on to the top of the tank. There she lay, soaking wet and shivering, but thankful to still be alive. Don't just lie there, child, the professor called up. What now? Look outside the window. We're in the middle of a storm. Time is of the essence. You need to tug the wire three times as a signal to Dotty to take off in the hot air balloon. The girl did what she was told. Tug, tug, tug. Next, Elsie leapt off the tank back onto the Diplodocus skeleton. And within moments, the length of wire tightened. Perfect, called out the professor. Up on the roof of the museum, a cold and miserable Dotty finally got the signal. As fast as she could, she untied the ropes that were holding the basket down and took to the skies. Whoosh! The lady was flying straight into the heart of the storm. Soon, bolts of lightning were exploding all around her. Boom, boom, boom. Against her better judgment, she steered the balloon into their path and... Bang! A rush of electricity struck the tin helmet on top of the balloon. Ting! The copper wire glowed as energy shot through it. Zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
Now, release me this instant. The celebration had come too soon because the mammoth had started thrashing around inside at the tank. It let out a cry, muffled by the water. Hoo! If they didn't get the creature out, and soon, it would drown. The professor wheeled himself over and lifted the pickaxe above his head before smashing it against the glass. Crunch! A patchwork of cracks appeared in the glass. Hoo! cried the animal under the water. The creature lurched forward and hit the glass with its tusks. Smash! All at once the glass fell away and icy water flooded the main hall, sweeping Elsie off her feet and the professor off his wheels. Swish! Ah! screamed the girl as she was hurled against the stone staircase. Doof! The professor had banged his head badly and was now lying face down in the water, his wheelchair on its side a few feet away from him. Professor! Professor! pleaded the girl. Suddenly the old man's eyes opened and then widened. Whatever you do, he began, don't look around. Of course, there is nothing like being told not to look around to make you look around. Slowly the girl turned her head. Just behind her was the mammoth, rearing up on its hind legs. Hoo! The instant those legs crashed down, Elsie and the professor would be dead. Chapter 32. Knocked Awake. Elsie wrenched the professor out of the way, just in time, before the mammoth's giant feet thumped on the floor. Smash! Hoo! It cried. Why is it trying to kill us? yelled the girl. We just brought it back to life. It's a wild beast, replied the professor. It's not going to say thank you. No, for goodness sake, help me. Elsie grabbed the old man under his armpits and pulled him up the huge stone staircase that led upwards through the main hall. When the pair were a few steps up, the mammoth spun around and smashed into the diplodocus skeleton. Crash! Elsie ducked as the giant bones came thundering down all around them. Whack! One struck the professor across the forehead and knocked him out cold. Doof! Professor! shouted Elsie. The girl slapped the old man across the face to wake him up. When that didn't work, she dragged him further up the stairs to escape the animal. The mammoth began pacing towards them. It reached the bottom of the steps, just as Elsie had managed to drag the professor halfway up. Surely the creature could not follow them up the stairs. To Elsie's horror, it could. No! cried the girl. Unsteadily, the mammoth rested its giant feet on the first step, then the second, then the third. Thud! 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 In a rush to flee further up the steps, Elsie dropped the professor. His head hit the stone. Clunk. Normally, this would have been enough to knock someone out. But as he was already knocked out, it actually had the opposite effect. It knocked him awake. Ouch! He cried. You're awake, replied Elsie. Have I missed anything? Uh, we're still going to die. Oh no. Whoo! The mammoth let out its distinctive cry again, its trunk aloft and its sharp tusks now inches from the pair's faces. The creature whisk whisked its head back as if getting ready to impale them. Help! cried the girl. Just then there was a mighty smash overhead. Kabang! Dotty had crashed her hot air balloon straight through the newly repaired stained glass window of the main hall. Smash! It descended at speed through the hall. The bottom of the wicker basket struck the mammoth hard on the head. Boof! Ooh! This cry sounded different, like a cry of fear. The mammoth scuttled back down the steps and across the main hall to hide under the shadow of an archway. Meanwhile, 
the basket landed with a thud and skidded across the floor until it came to a sudden stop against the wall. Crash! Oof! said Dotty. As the cleaning lady scrambled to her feet, she surveyed the scene. There were the scattered dinosaur bones, the shards of glass from the window and the tank, the pools of icy water, the broken basket and the hot air balloon made of a thousand handkerchiefs and one pair of bloomers strewn across the floor. Naughty mammoth! exclaimed Dotty. Look at this mess! It will take me all night to clear this up. Idiotic woman! That is the least of our troubles, interrupted the professor. The beast just tried to kill us. Isn't that right, Elsie? Elsie? The professor looked over his shoulder, but the girl had gone. Elsie, he called. Elsie? Unknown to him, the girl had made her way over to the archway to take a closer look at the mammoth. Keep back, you foolish child, shouted the professor. Shh, shushed the girl. You're frightening it. Whatever you do, don't touch it, shouted the professor. The brave little girl ignored him and reached out her hand to meet the creature's trunk. It was the only part of the mammoth that was not hidden in the darkness. First, its trunk performed a little dance around the girl's hand, like a snake being charmed. Then Elsie held out her hand flat and something magical happened. The prehistoric met the modern. The two touched. And next time we'll read chapter 33. Bye bye.